welcome. If you just join us, this is the Progressive Minds Show. My name is Senna, a.k.a. Alinko, and we are going to be listening to the people from Rogers Park. This segment is focused on community. This is where we pick a community and we try to talk about um, what is going on in there, the economic opportunities and whatnot. So this evening, we're going to be having this uh, great guest of ours tell us what it is, it is uh, what is special about Rogers Park. Okay, so we would uh, want to go straight to our uh, great, beautiful guest. Um, we have our honorable uh, alderman, alderwoman of Rogers Park, Maria Hayden. Maria Hayden, the last time I saw you, you were running for office. Actually, it was a week of elections, right? And yeah, I was gonna say it was really, it was really soon. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So, well, hey, uh, take a few minutes to introduce yourself to our audience and let us know what your office uh, is all about. With some of the things you've been doing so far, I know you have a short time. We're glad to have you here. Please take it from here. Sure. Thank you. Um, so good to see you again, and oh. good to see uh, several of my neighbors on tonight on the show. My name's Maria Haddon, and I am an older woman in the 49th Ward, so primarily the Rogers Park neighborhood and a bit of West Ridge. And it's uh, been a year and about a month and a half since I was sworn in, and it's been a very uh, unexpected year, I'll say. Mm -hmm. So first six months of the year, um, we spent a lot of time just getting out in the community, connecting to folks, uh, coming in after a 28-year incumbent, there's a lot of new relationships to make, and then a lot of things to build on um, from relationships that I had previously, but it's a lot of setting up a new office, getting a, a new staff acclimated, um, picking up on all the, the core services, and that's what we spent our first six months really doing. Um, of course, last summer we hosted a, a lot of community events, right, the Back to School Festival, um, sponsored a lot of the community fairs. And this summer looks totally different, right? With the COVID pandemic, everything has changed. Um, I'll say that some of our big issues um, from last year that are coming up, uh, again, this summer, we're still dealing with a lot of lakefront erosion issues. So with Lake Michigan being at record high, you know, as Captain Mike was talking about the weather, um, it's hard to talk about the weather without talking about the climate. Um, so we're still dealing with a lot of those issues. And then, of course, uh, our city budget. Um, we were facing quite a deficit. Um, the first budget season that we had uh, through the uh, November of last year, I spent a lot of time with colleagues really advocating for more resources for mental health so uh, services, for social services, things that I hear from our residents that we need. And um, I can say the first, uh, the first part of this year has been really overtaken largely by uh, COVID response and the pandemic. We've spent a lot of time um, working with community members and organizations to help people adjust to life during the pandemic. We set up a community response team working with neighborhood organizations, partners, and our state rep, Kelly Cassidy, um, with volunteers running a hotline, doing food deliveries, providing groceries. We raised over $60,000. We've been distributing hardship funds. Um, so just trying to be there for all the things residents need um, and to be responsive. Uh, also working with neighbors on what we're doing for uh, violence reduction in the community and preparing for yet another budget season with an even bigger deficit that we're facing. Okay. So was sum up the year. There you go. That's a that's a wonderful uh, summary of what is going on with the office and the Rogers Park community. Thank you so much for that. But I'd like to, uh, before we continue, I, w I, w I would like to pick your um, response with regards to how the pandemic has affected your community. Uh, mm -hmm. I know you've given us a synopsis of what you've been doing and whatnot, but you know maybe some spe specifics that you like audience to know. But before that, let me introduce my other distinguished guest. Uh, I don't think we have Michael Glazier uh, on here. Uh, I think we, okay, we'll see if we can get him. He's not here right now. But Andrea Graham is um, actually, she's going to be acting as my co special uh, host today. Co special host. I don't know if you ever heard of the term co special host, but <laughs> on Progressive Minds, we create things. So uh, she's also a great uh, guest. Uh, she is a creative thinker, change agent. Uh, with the urban community. She is actually a graduate student 
at uh, Northeastern University, right? I think it's in Rogers Park on the north side. Um, I think that's where it's at. Uh, she's also a staff member of the Sullivan High School. Next to her is Michael J. Harrington, who is a co-chair uh, Network 49, which is also resided, which is also situated in Rogers Park. He's also been a very long time resident of that community. Eva McCain is a community activist of Rogers Park and friends, um, she's an activist and friends of Rogers Park and Edgewater. Uh, of course, we've already introduced you all the women. And then we have Sandy Price. Sandy Price, uh, do we have Sandy Price? Okay, hopefully we will get her too. But Sandy Price is the director of Rogers Park Business Alliance. Hopefully we would get her on the conversation. So uh, before I go to all the women to tell us some specifics, uh, lady, ladies and gentlemen, you again, welcome to the Progressive Mind Show. Thank you. Thank you. Briefly, uh, Michael, uh, let's start with uh, uh, Andrea. You have to turn off your mic because I, I may not hear you. Excellent. Great. So since you, you and I are doing this today, uh, I still can't hear you. Just. Um, if you, okay, while she's, okay, great. You're good. You're good. Can you hear me now? Andrea? I can hear you clearly. Yes, okay, can you hear me? Great. So, Andrea, uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, you're good. Okay, while she sorts herself out, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Network 49 is all about before we go to uh, Andrea? Thank you. Um, Network 49 is a five year old community based organization. We are a membership organization comprised of homeowners and renters, people of all stripes who live in Rogers Park. We're focused on civic and community issues as well as politics. Okay. We organize committees around issues of housing, community safety, and policing. Um, public education is a priority for us, support for public schools, and our members are active in various spheres of community life. Um, we're also concerned about economic development. And um, that's about it. It's, it, it's members, there's a board of directors and active committees. And our website is network49.net. And we, of course, welcome anybody who lives in the 49th Ward in the Rogers Park community to join us. Excellent. Thank you for giving us that description of what the organization is about. And thank, uh, we would want to take um, Eva, can you hear us? Yes, I can. E excellent. So you have been a long time uh, uh, resident of Rogers Park. You're also a friend of Rogers Park and a social, I would say, I was a community activist. Um, yeah. All right. What else would you want uh, the audience to know briefly about Eva McCain? And if you say community activist, what are the specifics on the specific events or um, actions that you have been indulged in? Um, I have been very active with uh, the parks in the north of Howard community and getting the parks ex expanded, getting field houses, getting a field house built um, and doing other things with the parks that will um, benefit the community, the youth in the, the neighborhoods, the families in the neighborhoods um, so that they have a uh, a safe place to go. Um, I have also uh, been the CAPS beat facilitator mm -hmm. um, within the community for 11 years, trying to work with the police department to find um, community-based solutions to a lot of the crime um, that takes place in, in the area. Um, although I'm no longer the, the beat facilitator, I still am active in the, the CAPS program in trying to help them find solutions to um, make the neighborhood safe. Mm, thank you, great, great. Okay, so all the women, uh, oh, let's see if we can get Andrea back in. Andrea, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. All right. Am I heard? Yes, we can hear you. You just muted yourself again now. You should unmute yourself again. Yes. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, let me. 
Right, I'm a resident of the homeowner of Rogers Park. I've been here for over 35 years. I lived north of Howard, and then I've also lived south of Howard. And um, I am a student at Northeastern Illinois University. It's my professor who suggested that I do an ethnography uh, look at our community. So I took a walk around the neighborhood and saw some things that I've never seen before because I mostly drive. And it's better to walk sometimes. And we do have a very great neighborhood to walk and see some of the uh, wonderful things that are, that are happening in Rogers Park. So okay. I'm here and enjoy this occasion. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I know you are, can you tell us the connection you have with this other great guest? I know you have been, uh, I don't know if you work directly with them or if you have had some uh, projects that you had worked with. Them. Can you help us establish the relationship you have with this, some of the, uh, the other guests? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay, there's, uh, with Michael Glasser, uh, he's not here yet, but um, I have a relationship with the Rogers Park Builders Group. I've been going to their meetings for years and years, and one day I suggested that uh, they, uh, Michael Glasser, uh, restore a classroom at Sullivan High School that uh, was in need of uh, support for the students who are um, the low incidence students, the students who are, have autism. So he was able to help with that group and they raised the funds to, to get the room built. And then it spiraled into other things that he did for the school as well. Okay. So that's one thing. I have a connection with uh, Ava in the sense that, but okay. uh, with with her because of the, uh, I took a walk to the park and was to see the, the, the apples that they're growing there. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I just wanted to get the, um, I just want the audience to understand uh, your commitment and your work in the community, because I have been working with you for a long time now, and I do know your heart for the community, and that's why I wanted to, and then it was it was mainly through your efforts that's uh, a reason why we're able to get all those people here. And so uh, kudos to the work, great work that you put in to make sure uh, we, we were able to get this show. Now, why we do focus on community, sometimes on the progressive mind show is because our mantra is building our community. And so we want to have, we always want to engage uh, folk leaders in the community, folks in the community with their leaders to engage in dialogues that would um, enhance the uh, development of the people that resides in our, in our various uh, uh, residences. So, so that's why we're doing this. We do this every now and then, but all the women I wanted to ask you specifically how has COVID hit him? Because we know on, it, sometimes, sometime in uh, I think two months, a month or two ago, it was reported that Bronzeville was recording some of the highest numbers when it comes to uh, the communities, some of the areas that were hit very hit, hit hard with, with the COVID. So tell us maybe the situation with uh, um, uh, Rogers Park. Sure. Um, uh, the Rogers Park area, um, so including the 60626, but especially the 60645 zip codes, we were actually um, some of the highest numbers of infections and deaths mm -hmm. um, during the peak of the crisis as well. So if you look at um, some of the, the heat maps and data from the uh, Chicago website on coronavirus, you can see that we were, we were an area with a lot of high rates of infection. Um, so we worked a lot to do more public education and um, we are trying to get our testing numbers up. So we did three free COVID testing events last month and have three more uh, this month. So there's one coming up this Saturday, the 18th on Clark Street, uh, Clark and Morris in the Byline Bank parking lot. And there'll be a, um, and that's at uh, 10 a.m. or excuse me, 1 p.m. And there'll be a uh, drive-through event at the Gateway Plaza on the 25th. So making sure people get tested, making sure they know to wear the masks, um, and making sure people have access to the information and healthcare has been a, a big focus. Uh, we know that a, a month or so ago, I mean, with the whole protest, national protest that was going on, mm -hmm. uh, there was also that that came with the looting and whatnot. How hard was your community hit, if it was at all? Um, uh, a little bit. So there definitely were some break-ins to to a few local businesses. Um, it was a tense time as, you know, it was kind of widespread uh, unrest with a lot of protests and demonstrations. But as you mentioned, right, 
kind of after dark, um, you know, different folks would come out and break into some stores. So we did have a, a target in the neighborhood um, that was broken into um, a, a shoe store, um, a couple, a couple, like maybe le less than a handful. So fewer than five. Um, one of our 7-Elevens um, was robbed as well. Um, and thankfully, you know, we reached out to a lot of local businesses. We had people kind of prepare, take safety precautions, remove things from the windows, lock up valuables and, um, you know, knock on wood uh, a couple of nights of that. And uh, as things passed, um, we've been able to kind of get back to business. The people, so the businesses that were hit um, mm -hmm. is your uh, office, you know, doing anything or have you put in place anything in terms of assistance to some of the businesses that uh, that, that took a hit during, during this uh, unfortunate time? So aldermanic offices, I don't have resources to give directly, but the city did. Okay. Um, so we did put in as the city, um, we put in funds okay. and special small business loan funds that were extended um, and grants for businesses that were impacted by, um, by break-ins during the unrest and uh, an extended line of businesses that were impacted just um, for additional financial assistance because of all the downturn of business because of COVID. Um, one thing I'll note, um, as you, especially with the focus of your show, one of the best things about our community is how many locally owned and small businesses that we have. Um, we don't have a lot of big box stores, right? We don't have a lot of big corporate chains. And if you look around the city, where a lot of a lot of the breaking in, a lot of the looting that happened, uh, a lot of them occurred at a lot of big chain stores. Even just down the street from us in Evanston, a big shopping center with like a Best Buy and a Target, right? Um, were were targeted a couple of times. Um, but a lot of our small businesses here, um, thankfully, most of them were not impacted. And I think it's you know another good reason to to have kind of locally owned businesses and folks that are engaging with people in the community, because we tend to look out um, for each other. Mm. Um, why should somebody move in? I know because you know, you have a limited time. I'm trying to push all the questions that I can before you uh, leave us. I would, uh, Andrea, I don't know if you have a question for the older woman. Uh, yes. Okay, please go ahead uh, and ask your question. I was gonna ask you a question about the housing in the community. Is mm -hmm. there a building that's being built for the artists or the artists and other people that, uh, you know, I read about it, but I don't know if it was already built. Is that has happened since, uh, is that happening now? Or did it get built? No, I think you're referring to, there was a community meeting. There was a group with a proposal. They were applying for tax credits from the city to build um, a development at the Howard Ashland site. Is that what you're talking about, Andrea? And then a component of it, there was yeah. going to be affordable yes, yes, senior yes. housing, and then there was going to be a few units that were like an art live workspace. So they were not awarded their tax credits. Um, so that project um, did not continue. We are, however, um, doing what I wanted to do before they applied um, for their tax credits, um, which is we're working with the Metropolitan Planning Council. And this fall, um, neighbors will be able to engage with us over a series of meetings and a, an engagement process to talk about the area, that space, and to be able to be part of a process that puts together an RFP to say what neighbors want to see in that space. Um, so we're really going to focus on that. So who knows what will come out of it, but we're really centering it in community decision making so that we can have a like we can have a proposal process where we say this is city owned land here's what neighbors in the community have said that they want here and then developers can kind of apply to us um, and through our process to present ideas for that spot um i know and one more thing mm -hmm. no go ahead go ahead i'm going to ask a question about the schools and and having the police in the schools, that seemed to be a really big issue that I've heard. What is what is your views on that? Sure. So I signed on and sponsored an ordinance introduced by several of my colleagues, Alderman Taylor, Sawyer, and uh, Ramirez Rosa, um, to end the city's contract um, with CPS for the police in schools. Um, understanding uh, security needs 
that schools have, uh, hearing from colleagues in different places, and also hearing from um, you know staff and representatives from Sullivan High School, which is the only school in our ward that has the SRO, the school resource officer. Um, I think that we've got better ways that we can meet those needs and make sure schools are safe places and schools are no place for, for the police department, particularly under some of our current issues and circumstances. I know that uh, there was a special LSC meeting um, recently, my chief of staff was able to attend and that, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that the principal and the LSC and the community at Sullivan High School are engaging around this conversation. There's a survey out right now um, to gather, engage student and their family voices about what they want to see there. But I think that $33 million, um, those funds should be given to schools for schools to decide what they want to do. And right now the choice of, you know, do you want the police officers or do you get nothing? I think that's a false choice. So really looking forward to the next CPS board meeting. Um, I spoke at the last one to really encourage them to change the way that they uh, determine this policy. Mm. Excellent. Well, Excellent. very good. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I know I know some of the guests may. I don't know if uh, Michael uh, or Eva has a question that they may want to ask the alderman um, before he leaves. Uh, Eva and Michael, would you do you have a maybe a comment or respond to anything she said or ask a question before she takes leave of us? Well, and, you know, I guess I will share that the network forty nine our Really glad to hear it and know that we had to continue to support issues that our community cares about. No cops in schools is one of those issues. We need to be funding schools for education and letting students and faculty and parents work out violence or troubling issues at schools, not an officer with a gun on his head. Um, and I would note that Maria has taken leadership on a bunch of these issues, and we're glad of it. We're just really happy to have her working for the residents. We need that. It's a good change from where we've been for the past 20 years. All right, thank you. Uh, Eva, I don't know if you wanted to respond to something um, that she said. Actually, yes, there are actually two things that I would like to respond to. Um, one of the things being the, the police in the school, um, I think um, those funds should really be allocated to more social services within the schools because there are so many young people who are in the schools who um, they, they need other kinds of assistance, not police to come and handcuff them. Um, they, they need to have social workers who can and, and psychologists and people that they can go and talk to, people that they can go and work out many of the issues that they have because a lot of the issues are starting in the home and they have no uh, no positive escape and then going to school and having police officers watching over you um, all the time and suspecting that you're up to to no good and they need more positive programs that are taking place in the schools that engage them and that will um, pique their interests so that they have other alternatives besides hanging out in the streets and doing things that they have no business doing within the schools. The other thing that I wanted to address with Maria is that I'm very glad to hear that um, with the project that was going to take place at the Howard Ashland um, site that uh, she is going to be opening it up more to the community because I know I have spoken to many of the gardeners that are there and um, they actually want to keep that garden. They would like to see that garden become bigger and more prosperous for themselves. Well, not prosperous necessarily financially, but um, in a way Abundant. right now there's, there, there are plots there and they're growing food for the community that they are giving out to the community for free. And these are things that um, the community needs because they need more more fresh food alternatives, which is one reason um, why the the orchard, why why the park advisory council at Willie White Park across the street from uh, Hello Howard Garden pursued so for five years to get the orchard planted at Triangle Park. 
and it happens to be the first orchard that the Chicago Park District has planted within the city of Chicago. All right. Well, uh, I know maybe uh, she might want to say something. Uh, if, yeah, go ahead, Alderman. Oh, Alderman. Sure, sure. I'll just say um, it, it's really great to see you all. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for the support and the kind words and for doing all that you do in our community. And, you know, Alinko, especially, you know, as you spoke about what the show is about, it's wonderful to have these guests on. I know we might have a couple of more that join, um, but Andrea is a leader in our community and, and so are these other guests. And so I think, you know, it's one of the things that um, we can all point to in our different neighborhoods is that this is, this is what makes us uh, strong, right? Um, as we're going through difficult things, it takes this participation. It takes folks who have been in the neighborhood for 30 years and people who are brand new, um, who take action, who build relationships and who are working to make improvements in, in our neighborhoods and on our block. So really appreciate being in community with you all. Excellent. But, but I, I, I didn't know that was going to be your last words, but I wanted to ask you quickly. Sure. Um, what makes your community stand out? Why should anybody want to move to Rogers Park and live there and do business? Absolutely. Um, it's the people. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't find, um, I'm biased, I know. I've lived in only a couple other neighborhoods in Chicago, but I've worked in a lot. And this is, this is a, a real community. Um, and in every part of it, on every block, you're going to find neighbors, business owners, um, uh, community community workers, people from our schools or our libraries or our parks um, who know each other, who want to know each other and who are engaging. Um, you know, we love our neighborhood. We love our neighbors. And um, we're here asking questions. Um, we still are one of the more affordable places or most affordable places to live on the north side of the city. We've got great public transit. Um, and uh, we've got access to the lake, even though the beaches are closed. Don't go to the beach, the beaches are closed. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful community geographically and definitely just because of the people. Mm. Um, we've got so many folks who, you know, they come here, they start their families, they start their businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of immigrant entrepreneurs, um, and, and, you know, people who take care of each other. So um, I can't think of a neighborhood I'd rather live in. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know. Uh, One thing before, you go, before, you, before you go, I would like to know can you let, give us the boundaries of our community? So people know. Um, what are the boundaries of our community? You know, well, the, the. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the boundaries. Ward. I'll give what you the boundaries mean? of the ward. Yeah, so the ward. So we are to the east, right? We're at the lake. Um, to the south, we're yes. basically to Devon. There's a little clip there. Um, to the west, for most of the world, we go to Clark Street, and then we jog over uh, a bit to Ridge. And then on our northern boundary, we go as far west as Western. And our uh, northern boundary is Evanston. Um, so Howard Street for most of it, and then um, all the way up to June Way. So Evanston is, is what's north of us. The lake is what's east. Um, western Ridge and Clark Street for our western boundary and Devon for our southern. All right. Thank you. Well, no, thank you. Wonderful. No, thank you're, you. welcome. you're welcome. Before she takes, uh, I know you want to move of us, so take one quick break. When we come back, we would continue with the discussion with the other panel. Thank you, all the women. We would hopefully we could get to do this again. That was the other woman of Rogers Park, uh, the 49th year of uh, Rogers Park. Uh, no, the 49th year of Rogers Park. Okay. Other woman, uh, Maria Hayden. Um, she was part of the guest this evening, and she was definitely giving. I mean, she was uh, giving us a breakdown of what 
what this squad is all about, some of the challenges they've been through during this pandemic, the opportunities there, why you should move to Roger Squad, why you should do business at Roger Squad. And uh, we want to go to our um, um, our guest, uh, the, the remaining guest. She had to leave. Uh, you know, all the women and and uh, mayors and congressmen, all those government officials have extremely busy schedules. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she couldn't stay uh, as long as we would have wanted to, you know, help us go through this. But this great guests are very able and well informed regard with regards to Rogers Park and the Chicago Long area. So we definitely would be able to get enough of information uh, uh, with this um, on this platform. If you want to ring in the show, uh, please feel free to do so. The number is scrolling down the screen is two. No, 815, sorry, 815-277-5046. If you want to ring in and ask a question or make a contribution, please go ahead and do so. We are talking today is focused on community, a special segment on the Progressive Mind Show where we bring in leaders of a particular area to uh, talk about what they have been going through, or what they are dealing with, the opportunities and challenges there. And uh, we today, this week is on Rogers Park. So we just we have our great guests here: Michael Harrington, Eva McCain, Andrea Graham. Um, now, Eva, you heard everything that the uh, uh, the other woman talked about. Uh, we also wanted to know what should make anyone move to Rogers Park. Now, apart from all that she said, you have been a long time resident. Tell us your personal experience uh, living there, and then we'll take Michael Michael's perspective too. Uh, well, I've lived in Rogers Park since 1982. I um, moved into Rogers Park um, when I was in my last year of college, hmm. and um, it was I lived I moved into the north of Howard area, which at the time was not what you would call the the greatest place to to live at the time. Um, however, it was very affordable for me, which is one of the attributes to of Rogers Park is that there is so much affordable housing with, within the community. However, much of the affordable housing that was in the area that I live in, which is the north of Howard area, um, was not the best maintained. Uh, yes. Let, let, me, let me hold you for a second. Looks like we have a call on the line. Yes. Uh, uh, we'll try and take this call, see if we can get through it, and then we'll come to you. Um, let's give him one second. Uh, caller, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hi, this is Sandy Price from the Rogers Park Business Alliance. I was just trying to join in the conversation. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, you said, oh, this is Sandy Price, you said? Yes. Oh, Sandy, you couldn't join yes. us? with the, You couldn't uh, get into the link? I could not. Okay. So if you... Um, okay, I am going to try to send you an email, but let me see if I can, let me see if I, uh, I don't know if you want me to read out your email publicly because you can, you can join us. It shouldn't be a problem at all. Everybody just, I think I did not, I probably did not get your email, right? So here is what I'll do. But anyway, now that I have you online, can you go ahead? And Sorry, everyone. I'm happy to join this way. Okay. So can you go ahead and, and, and tell our audience who Sandy Price is, what you represent in the community of Rogers Park. Uh, sure. So I've um, been with the Rogers Park Business Alliance for almost 18 years. Okay. We do economic development in Rogers Park. We're like a chamber of commerce where we do mostly business attraction and business retention in the community. We also do entrepreneurial training. We host a farmer's market um, and we offer technical assistance to small businesses in the community. So you were definitely, okay, so you were the director of Roger Squawk Business Alliance. Yeah. And how long have you held this position, if I may ask? I've held the position of executive director for eight years. Okay. And I've been with the organization for 18. Okay. So being being the director of the uh, Roger Squawk Business Alliance, now is that, now, what would you say has been the, um, I would say, the effect of this pandemic on your office with regards to providing resources to businesses and institutions in Rogers Park? 
the pandemic was, um, we, we had to definitely shift what we were doing. Mm -hmm. In the first couple of weeks, we were all obviously working from home, like everyone else during the stay at home order. And so we started calling the businesses in the first two to three weeks. We spoke to about 200 business owners in Rogers Park to find out what they were going to be doing, what they needed to continue, mm -hmm. if they were allowed to do so, how we could help. We also took that time to um, attend as many meetings, conversations, and webinars that we could about what was being offered to help the business community. Um, there, was, there was a lot of um, last-minute decisions for funding for the businesses. There were grants that were available and loans that were available, and so we were able to gather all that information and then share it with the businesses to kind of determine what their needs were and then share with them what was available to help them. Okay. Uh, the other woman just spoke a few minutes, but she had, she had to rush out. Uh, so far, what would be your, I mean, I know you've been working closely with her. What would be your assessment of her, uh, the, her office with regards to the response to the pandemic so far? Yeah, no, I think she, I think she's doing a great job. So I've been listening. Um, to your conversation, and I think that she's been doing a great job. I think that, um, you know, they immediately set up a Rogers Park community response team. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that community is full of volunteers. So the older woman mentioned that the best thing about the Rogers Park community is the people. Okay. I totally agree with that. There are a lot of people who take ownership and want the community to be the best that it could be. And there are a lot of volunteers. There are a lot of people that are donating money and time and energy to help others, um, including the business community. So when our businesses had to immediately pivot and they started selling gift cards because they couldn't keep their doors open and they had bills to pay, the community supported them in those efforts. And the community donated to the Northside Community Resources to help people who were going to lose their homes or couldn't buy food or, um, you know, whatever else they needed money for before unemployment kicked in and before it was even decided that there was going to be a stimulus package. Um, these community people are the ones who stood up to help each other. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for expanding, uh, breaking that, that, that down for us. I know Andrea may have a question for you, but if you don't mind holding on, uh, if you don't mind, we would like to put you on a brief hold, uh, Sandy, while uh, we go That's to fine. our other guests. Okay, thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, Eva, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but then I would just wanted to bring her in. So please go ahead and finish your um, statement or, or what you were talking about. Oh, I, I was just talking about how, what kind of what um, the section of the neighborhood was like when, when I first um, moved into Rogers Park, how, um, how, how much crime there was and how over time um, the, the community coming together to help solve some of the, the crime issues. Crime still exists up here and it's probably the area that still has the most amount of crime in Rogers Park but there are people who are willing to, to work and to go out and talk to people who live in the community and ask them the kinds of things that they would like to see in the neighborhood and uh, what they think would help to improve the community, not just in the section, the area that I live in, but in all of Rogers Park. And that's what makes Rogers Park such a great community is that the people are willing to band together and work together to make this a better community. Mm. Thank you so much, Michael. I um, again. So you you also have lived in Rogers Park for a very long time. Uh, yes. Tell us your experience with uh, as with with that regards, and um, why somebody why anybody should you know try to move out there. Well, I'll tell you, I I grew up in High Park in the far south on the south side of Chicago. And I've lived in about a dozen communities over the years. Moved to Lakeview. I've lived in Edgewater. I lived in Humboldt Park, Wicker Park, and um, Andersonville a bit. And finally, in mid '90s, moved to Rogers Park. Rogers Park, right here. This is where I raised my kids, and it's a wonderful community. Everybody says the people, 
that's right. It's the people in the community. <laughs> of course, we have amazing, we have an abundance of parks. And we have an amazing lakefront. Being able to look at the lake, even if we can't swim right now because the beaches are closed because of COVID. We are right on the lakefront, and that is an amazing resource. But the people here, whether there is a problem or there's an opportunity, this is a neighborhood where organizations and individuals can stand up, take leadership, and come together to make something good happen, to either address a problem or to enhance some great opportunity. We have wonderful art. We have wonderful festivals. We have wonderful restaurants. We have community organizations. We have some good schools and people supporting them and family together and stuff. I, you know, I just think it's a great place to raise kids, to enjoy, whether you've got kids or not. There's a great array of people here. You know, Rogers Park, besides it's black, white, and brown, of course. It's also a very diverse community with dozens of immigrants from uh, immigrants from dozens of nations speaking many languages here. It's an amazing community to, to experience, and I think it's fun, and it's exciting, and it's interesting, and it's inspiring to me. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if Andrea has a question, please go ahead. Uh, if, if, if not, we want, okay, go ahead, Andrea. Andrea, do you have a question? Do you ever spend any time walking around? Yes, I want to ask to uh, Michael Harrington. Um, in the neighborhood, um, do you know about what, what do they do for the youth in that neighborhood? Have you paid, you know, see that or see where the youth are going in this community? Do you know? Well, there, there, there's some organizations or if you don't know. Yeah. No, there's a, there are a few organizations doing good things. And I, I'd say, interestingly, we have a lot of churches in Rogers Park also, many of which have youth yes. programs. They're pretty cool. But the other thing that's important is our park district facilities. And I want to give lots of yeah. thumbs up to Eva McCann, who didn't really give herself enough credit for being the leader to create Willie White Park, our large, magnificent park facility and park land right on Howard. Eva led a team of people for a decade, mostly great women, raising funds and pushing that legislation through to make it happen. And Eva deserves tons of credit for that. But our park districts, are a major resource. There's, whether it's uh, Potawatomi Park or Loyola Park or Willie White Park as well, and smaller parks, Passion Park, without, throughout the community, also have services for kids and have programs and a lot of our organizations use the park facilities as a site to offer programs. Um, I'm involved with a Just Harvest. I'm on that board where we also do involve youth in growing and food, nutrition work, and also political and community spirit work and, and things that stay involved. That's good for kids as well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit? I was going to ask if you could tell us a little bit more about a Just Harvest. I noticed as I walk around the neighborhood, there's some gardens there, and they also grow food, too, for to feed the people. You, you, can you say anything more about that? A Just Harvest, our mission is to fight hunger. And we not only do it through a garden and raising food and taking food donations and a daily for the past nearly 30 years dinner program at A Just Harvest for the homeless or any family in need, people who are hungry. We also not only providing food services, we also tackle and address these systemic issues that cause hunger. So these issues are in our community of housing. The issues are about education. The issues are about the injustices in parts of our society, racial and others. The issues are about helping people with income instability. So a Just Harvest works and tackles both of those. There's some really wonderful staff people and some amazing members of the community that serve on the board that work pretty hard all the time to provide services for youth and families in need in the community. That's like a summary of what a Just Harvest is. Thank you so much. You'll still, listen. this is the Progressive Mind Show. Uh, you are, uh, talk, just heard from Michael Harrington of Rogers Park. Uh, we are uh, 15 minutes past 6, p, uh, 6 p.m. here in the city of Chicago. We want to take 
one short break. When we come back, we would continue with my great guest. Uh, I know Eva has a point to make. I know Eva, I think I'm interested in you elaborating on your efforts in getting, um, uh, is it the park, uh, that park that Michael mentioned? Uh, I, I really want you to you know, get into how you had to make that happen. I think that's a very great um, achievement for yourself and for the community and we want to know about that. Stay tuned, we shall be right back. Welcome back to the show. My name is Tena, a.k.a. Alinko, and we come your way every Wednesday with a professor of my show from 6 to 8 p.m. I know we also have Sunday on the line. Very soon we shall be going to Sunday. Uh, we are open for business, okay? Uh, the pandemic did not affect us, okay? We did not have to close our business. So anytime you want to advertise your business or um, an event or, you know, get the word out there regarding any project that you're on, we, we, we were more than happy to, happy to help you uh, achieve that. Okay, so uh, reach us at info.progressiveminds at gmail.com. Info.progressiveminds at gmail.com. You can also ring 815-409-9123. The studio number to ring in to contribute or ask a question to the show is 815-277-5044. This program is also live on our YouTube page, which is The Progressive Mind Show. Eva, I, I posed a question earlier. Would you mind responding to that? Yes. Um, Willie White Park came into existence because um, there were just so many kids just hanging out in the streets and so many latchkey kids that had no place to go when they got out of school other than home and to watch television and, um, you know, try and find things to entertain themselves. And so um, a group of community members, um, Sister Cecilia being one of them, who was the person who got me initially involved in the, the parks in the north of Howard area to begin with, um, we went out there and we, we started with the kids. We started asking the kids, what would you like to see in this neighborhood that would get you off of the streets. And the thing that they were saying is like, well, Kiwanis Park, which was a small park that was on Ashland um, that had a very small field house that was literally big enough to put a pool table in and, and a couple of chairs and that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, even though they did some fantastic work, they had a park supervisor at the time, uh, Jim Hobson, who did some great things with many of the kids, but the, the park was still too small to accommodate all of the kids in the neighborhood. And the thing that the kids said most is like, we would like to see a larger park. We would like a larger field house so that there's more for us to do. We don't necessarily want to be out in the streets. And so at that time, um, this, this started around 1980, uh, 1993, 94, uh, when we started asking the questions. And we um, then went to the alderman at the time and asked him and you know, he wasn't for a field house. So we said, you know, but this is something that is desperately needed. And so we then kind of stepped over his head. We, we went to our um, state rep at the time. We went to our congresswoman. We went to um, our state senator. And we said, this is something that we need. Will you help us? And they all thought it was a great idea. And we we took it from there and we then got um, parents involved. We got co the community organizations in the community, in the, in the neighborhood involved. Um, organizations like Family Matters, the Howard Area Community Center, what was then called DevCore, which is now um, the Rogers Park Business Alliance and, and um, Starfish Organization. And um, we brought in um, Foundation 
and you know we we worked with them to try and build a team so that we could approach the Chicago Park District, approach the the mayor. It was Mayor Daly at the time to work to get this building built, this the the park expanded. After we got the park and they said, oh, well, you can use the Gale School gym um, for your facility. It's like, no, Gale School closes at a certain time and that, and that would not allow programming for adults if adults need any kind of programming. And so we continued our fight. The, the park was finished, was completed in the year 2000. We had um, a playground build that brought 500 volunteers from around Rogers Park to build our first play, do our first playground build in Rogers Park. It was amazing the numbers of people that kept showing up and showing up and showing up um, because they all knew that this was something that our community needed. And um, we got 40 restaurants to donate tons and tons of food, restaurants and businesses in the neighborhood to donate food for this playground build. And, um, it's like okay, we've got the we we've expanded the park now. Now we still need a building, and we finally got the building built in two thousand and eight. It was completed, and then after that, a private organization came in and wanted to take it over, the Boys and Girls Club. And it's like okay, the Boys and Girls Club is a great organization, but this building was built with the hard labor of the people in this community. It was funded by public funds, go uh, government funds, and we are not going to let a private organization come in here and take over this building. So that was yet another fight that we had on our hands in order to make sure that this building remained a public building and um, open to the people who live in Rogers Park and, and the city of Chicago, In mm -hmm. I mean, because, anyone can can come to programs there and we've got some great program well up until covid-19 anyway we had some some great programming that went on there and um you know our our efforts don't stop there we're um working with we 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 in 2018 we got um the first orchard as i mentioned earlier planted at triangle park and we're, we're trying to do some placemaking efforts in, in Triangle Park um, to have a small sculpture garden and have the community design a mosaic to go along the cemetery wall. Um, so our, our efforts continue and we are constantly working to, to improve the, the parks in the area. Uh, thank you. I think we still have um, Sandy online. Unless Andrea has a question, I wanted to go to Sandy, but if you do have a question for Sandy, Andrea, you can go for it. Yes. I was gonna ask uh, Ava McCandice if she can briefly talk about Gale School. I think they got some uh, participatory funds to build a garden over there. Do you know much about that? I, um, I know a little bit about that. Yes, they did get some participatory funds um, to, to get the garden built. And, um, you know, it was, it was very exciting because um, Actually, that's the um, how we ended up with an orchard at Triangle Park was because participatory budgeting wanted to build a skateboarding park in Triangle Park, but they had, didn't ask any of the people who lived in the neighborhood. But anyway, the Gale, the Gale Garden, Anthony's Garden, um, Anthony was one of the people who worked at a Just Harvest, and he worked with um, kids at the school doing gardening and so forth in the uh, school lab. And he unfortunately died. And um, the school felt very strongly, um, you know, about his, his death and they wanted to do something in to honor him. And so they got together and decided to to build the garden at, at Yale. And it's it's a wonderful garden. It's a beautiful garden. I I'm sure you've been there. Mm, okay, great. I, know I walked over. I did. Thank you, Michael. Michael, do you have uh, do you wanted to contribute to comment on uh, what Eva said earlier? So I I, I want to note. There's one more thing we should note about Willie White Park. It's okay. named after a wonderful black yes. woman, Willie White. She was, I believe, a runner. And 
athlete and an Olympic star and there's all kinds of tribute and beautiful reflections on her life and what she meant as a as a sports athlete and inspiring for kids. It's just everything comes together there. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Actually, Willie White had a, she, she was a five-time Olympian and her Olympic career spanned almost 30 years. Mm. So yes, she was fantastic. From the 1950s to the 1970s. Mm. She, no, she that's was a very inspiring woman. Thank we you. pay attention to black history up here. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I was yes. going to say that. Yes, we have to also mention that we have to also mentioned that there's been, uh, I found as I walked through the neighborhood, the Pollocks, you know, there's a house that was the first African-American family that lived in Rogers Park. Did you know that? It was on Lunt, 1900 West Lunt. I walked yep. over there and I took a picture of the house and it has a little plaque that, that, that gives tribute to that family. They had a rough, they had a hard time in the community, but they, they were there. And also Chicago was the, our city, Rogers Park, was the first community after, you know, it was a village at one point. It was our first community of all the 77 communities that we have. So that's a pretty good uh, thing that we're the first. No, that is, that's very true. Um, I remember you had sent me that picture uh, of the, uh, so that picture is supposed to be the first, the, the, the first, the, that is the home that belongs to the first black person that uh, actually founded Rogers Park. Am I accurate? No, that was the first black a family that lived in Rogers Park. I okay. think it was it was kind of founded with Rogers. The person Rogers yeah. Park is named after a person named Rogers, and you know Dewey and who has the history? Do you know anybody here? Is Sandy uh, there? Does she know? I'm here. I know that Philip Rogers, but Rogers Park is named after Philip Rogers. But I don't know who the first African American or Black. I don't know who that would be. Okay. Well, um, uh, I was going to go. You in the 1900s. Not you. Oh, okay. Look. Hey, Michael. I am the first. Look who's coming person. on board. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Glasser. Michael, we've been waiting for you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Michael, you just uh, Michael just joined us, listeners. Uh, Michael, can you tell us? Uh, who you are, what you represent, I mean, the organization you represent, and why you are here, of course. I mean, you know why, uh, but our audience would like to know, uh, you know, the purpose of the conversation this evening. So if you don't mind. Well, um, again, my name is, is Michael Glasser. I would um, like to say that I um, was born in Oak Park or in the west side of Chicago, but I first moved up to Rogers Park in law school and um, returned to Rogers Park throughout my adult life. Every time I experienced a midlife crisis, I seemed to want to move back here. So uh, I, um, but I, 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 you know, I have from time to time left Rogers Park and tried out different parts of the city. I tried the Gold Coast, I tried the West Loop. Um, always return because of Andrea Graham. You know, it's hard, hard to hard to live far from Andrea. Um, but really, <laughs> as much as that sounds tongue in cheek, I moved back because of the things that Andrea um, uh, uh, represents in Rogers Park, as well as the other fine guests on, on this panel. Um, it's a very special place, and uh, it's it's um, for many reasons. It's just a place that I've always feel comfortable and feel like I'm home and I feel like I can make a little bit of a difference in people's lives. Mm. So um, I, I've been involved in the real estate world. I've owned buildings here. I've sold buildings here, but then I decided to uh, purchase uh, uh, um, years ago and uh, have been involved in several nonprofits in the community. Um, perhaps I'm best known locally for being president twice of the Rogers Park Builders Group. And, uh, but I've also gotten involved with Sullivan High School uh, about five or six, maybe seven or eight, I don't even know how many years ago, but I've been involved in Sullivan High School. 
as well as the um, Northside uh, Community Development Corporation, which uh, works towards um, preserving home ownership uh, and, mor and mortgage foreclosure uh, relief for, for, for uh, newer homeowners on the north side of Chicago, largely Rogers Park. So there you have it in a variety of ways. I uh, love supporting Rogers Park restaurants. I, I always enjoy going to restaurants where I know the owner. And there have been some, are some amazing restaurants and some amazing people that own these places. And especially now, we all need to go uh, gangbusters doing our best to support the, these local businesses who are already so well supported by the Rogers Park Business Alliance. Um, so I think that's a long-winded answer to your question, isn't it? Yeah, you, <laughs> you did well. Um, I wanted to ask, so Rogers Park Builders Group is basically uh, a real estate uh, kind of organization uh, based off what you just said, or would you want to distinguish what the organization stands for in your narrative? Well, we formed in 1993 uh, when Rogers Park was a far different place. Um, there were many, many troubled buildings. Uh, in fact, things were so tough for those of us that owned apartment buildings in Rogers Park that there was a movement of thought aloft to uh, uh, when we put our ads in the Tribune or the Reader or the Sun Times. Back then, we used to place classified ads in print journalism. Uh, many many people started advertising Loyola Park. Uh, Rogers Park was a bad name. We, it was hard to attract people to want to be up, up here back then. There, there were many instances of crime. There were certainly many instances of, of bad landlords, uh, the likes that uh, we don't see in this neighborhood today in any great, uh, there's different issues today. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, but the turnaround, I really felt, um, was something that we helped contribute to because we stood for responsible property ownership, responsible development, uh, responsible investment, and giving back to the community. And so, you know, we've, we've been very active ever since 1993, and we've survived and endured and been relevant in different ways as the economic cycles have changed. Mm -hmm. um, the issues in 1993 were different in 2008. We're, we're different uh, at another, you know, uh, different today. You know, it's uh, we've evolved, but we've always been a presence in the in the neighborhood and feel like we've been re responsible, um, responsible. In fact, that's how I met Andrea was through the um, the builders group. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, giving us a good explanation uh, with regards to the two. Uh, Michael, you went off. OK, I, we still have Sandy on the line, is it? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still here. Okay, straight. So, Sandy, um, you work, I mean, based off your experience, I mean, your, um, it, within the time span, with the life, your time span with Rogers Park, uh, can you, apart from your organization, your institution that helps with businesses in that neighborhood, uh, what are some of the supporting institutions or organizations that play this type of role that your office play and how effective have they been to the cause of um, Roger Sparks' uh, progress. Um, organizations that do things differently than what we do, is that what you're asking? Yeah, like I'll say supporting organizations and institutions that help to progress the projects uh, and, and whatnot in the uh, in Roger Spark, apart from your organization, sure. the, the uh, Roger yeah. Spark uh, Business Alliance. I think, I think a lot of the different organizations work very well together. We. Mm -hmm. Um, the, can, you, the can you identify like can you identify a few prominent ones? Sure. The organization Mike was talking about, the um, Northside Community Resources, which mm -hmm. used to be the Rogers Park Community Council. Um, we work very well with them. They do a lot of uh, work around affordable housing. They do landlord tenant training. Uh, they do access to capital assistance. So, you know, if we have a business who is looking for access to capital because they're um, credit scores are low. Um, you know, we would reach out to Northside Community Resources and they could help our clients with um, get, be, becoming more bankable. Mm -hmm. um, the Howard Area Community Center is another amazing organization. They do just about everything you could possibly imagine, including 
uh, workforce development, which is one of the areas where we work with them because we have businesses that are always looking to hire people and they have people that are looking for jobs. We, we at the Rogers Park Business Alliance actually just recently hired three um, referrals from the Howard Area Community Center Workforce Development Organization. Mm-hmm. Um, Family Matters does after school programming and we work great with them. Adjust Harvest, who does uh, they have a, a meal program. They serve meals 365 days a year to the community. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just there are just so many amazing, great organizations in Rogers Park. And we, we worked with, uh, Eva was talking earlier about the community garden, the Hello Howard Community Garden. It's run by the Peterson Garden Project, and we're the ones who brought them into Rogers Park and showed them this piece of land that they truthfully didn't want to put a garden in because it was bigger than any garden they've ever done. And we convinced them that we could, um, we had enough people in the community that would want to participate. And there are 218 plots in that garden and they've never had a garden that big. The biggest one prior to that was 90 plots. And, you know, they're all full every year. Um, And it's just a really great, great, like I said earlier, great community, a lot of people who want to do a lot of stuff and work well together. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we want to take a, just a few moments to acknowledge uh, there's been a lot of comments on Facebook and maybe some of these questions might be uh, directed to some of our guests. Uh, Tommy says that, I'll put it up here, she says, wonderful black uh, queen, yes, yes, oh, great sport athlete, Miss White, black history, finest, thanks, at Michael Carrington. Well, that's, uh, thank you for, well, I, whilst we are at, you know, black history stuff, I think this is what um, uh, Andrea and Michael was alluding to the, with regards to, this is the first house, the first home um, or the home that was owned by the first black man that, uh, like the black first black residents of uh, Rogers Park. Uh, Andrea, is this correct? That is correct. Okay, okay, Michael. Uh, uh, it's on Lent, it's on Lent about the 1900 black home. Okay, Michael, does this look familiar to you? I've never been there, but it looks like a nice place. Actually, okay. I, I have seen it, and I knew I did know about that family, and I believe they moved into the neighborhood in, in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, sometime in that area. So I was aware of them. Mm. Um, I, I have been told that the house is on Lund, let's put it like that, um, in the 1900 block. And I've passed by that house a million times. I just didn't realize that that was exactly the house. And I I have seen it. Okay. Okay. Thanks for helping to explain that. Um, Okay. We, let me see here. Well, let's go back to our comments. There are a ton of them. And uh, let's see if there's a question here. Um, Okay. That was a comment from Tommy. And um, let me say this, thanks for being a voice to the voiceless and fighting for the public fund uh, building and programs. Uh, Eva McCain, that was a comment for you. And she says, uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, this is for Okima Lewis. Uh, he says, thank you, Andrea Graham, for asking questions that impact us all. As a former student of NEIUCCICS campus, where you are a graduate student, urban community studies is an important field of study one looking to be a vital part of the challenges facing families today. So glad you are part of the show, Progressive Minds. Thank you, uh, Kima uh, Okima Lewis, for your comment. You put another comment on there. Uh, thank you for that. And I think there's a bunch of comments here. I'm trying to see if there's a question that uh, is directed to any of you here. Um, okay, so this is a com- comment. And I think there's another comment here. Um, okay, so Oben, Oben, Ope John is a good friend. He's also uh, chiming in from Texas. Oben, thank you so much for always supporting the Progressive Mind Show. Even though you were in Texas, you are you lived you used to live in Chicago, and I'm sure you're concerned about things that are going on here. Uh, Kima says, great information on focus to feed the hungry. My heart goes off to Michael Harrington and Eva McCain for her humble comments about the great resource she has been to Rogers Park families and youth. Uh, this, uh, from the comments that are coming in, you can tell Rogers Park is really uh, a close knit community with very great people. Now, I also want to mention that the number to ring in for this 
So if you want to contribute or ask a question is 815-227-5047. Um, Kimberly Jackson says, we are a diverse people. Thank you for your comment. Um, I think there's a, there's a question from Tommy. She says, does health disparities and inequality gaps affect the access of COVID-19 testing? I think this is a very, very great question. Anybody want to jump on this? Um, well, I know that I have seen various um, sites around the Rogers Park area where they have been providing free COVID-19 testing to residents. Um, I know it was at Gale at some point. Um, Maria Haddon had mentioned that it's going to be on Clark Street. Um, I've seen it just in, in various different locations where they have been doing free COVID-19 testing. So they are trying to um, get to the people who are unable to go out and um, get the testing themselves. The testing is coming to them. So I've been very happy to see that happening here in, in the community. Okay, thanks for thanks for that. I think we had a little technical uh, issue here. We will sort it out. Uh, we will we, we'll sort it out. You all can still hear me though, right? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So I think yes. there's another question here. Um, uh, she says, uh, are the high mortality and mobility rates in your community more related to high disparity gaps in access to testing and good health quality of minorities? Or or people not following preventive guidelines of wearing PPE or access to PPE and testing. Um, again, anybody wants to uh, volunteer uh, and respond to this question? Well, oh, go on. Of, you know, all of the above issues, it's a nationally documented fact that people of color have experienced greater suffering due to the coronavirus, but also around Illinois and Chicago right now, we're concerned about people not wearing their masks and people congregating when they shouldn't be. And the rates that were going down are suddenly this week started going up, the rates of infection and the number of people dying. But it remains a concern. It's not just Roger Park, it's, it's a concern around the globe for everybody. Right, and and also there are a high. There's a large number of nursing homes in the Rogers Park community, and um, as far as East Rogers Park, the numbers have not been as high as they have been in West Rogers Park, from what I've been reading. And many of those, um, much of the mortality um, rate has been coming from the nursing homes that were in West Rogers Park from what I've been reading. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, we were trying to just uh, sort our technical issues out. So it would be taken care of. Thank you so much for, well, it looks like we're back on. Uh, this thing's, this thing's happened. So please pardon that little uh, break in there. Uh, Giovanni, no, Jovan Leslie Monique uh, is watching us. Thank you for chiming in, Jovan. Um, I would, okay. So let's do this Try and get myself here. Okay, great. Right, you all can see me. Okay, so we have uh, Sammy Murphy watching us. Uh, Sa uh, Maria, um, Sammy Murphy says Maria, well, um, or oh, Maria, okay, that was when Maria was here. Uh, Rebecca says, uh, great job, Captain, and oh, well, I think we have another comment from Tommy. Tommy, thank you so much for being a contributor to this show. Uh, please share the feed if you're watching us on Facebook so we can get the word out. Today, we are talking to the people from Rogers Park. Now, I did want to go to the panel again. Um, uh, Michael, what are now, what, what would you say? Can you tell us about the political climate of Rogers Park? Are people involved? Uh, this year is another big uh, you know, uh, election season or election year. Uh, do you think that people are typically involved in the political process? And what are you, being a very long resident in uh, that community, doing to help mobilize people to understand the, the, the urgency of getting into politics or voting this year? I think it's a very appropriate question for me and for Rogers Park to be on Progressive Mind show. Thank ours, you. Ours is a very progressive <laughs> community. 
um, number one, we have extremely high involvement in local, state, Chicago state and national politics. I most recently was working as the coordinator of the Bernie Sanders campaign here in Rogers Park. Um, we have a tremendous involvement of volunteers in all levels of politics in our city. Our organization, Network 49, by the way, I should mention, was one of the ones leading the campaign to elect Maria Haddon as our new alderman. We endorsed her 100%. All of our members worked hard to support her. Um, we also have, but on the gen in general, our neighbors of Marjorie Park, people in this community pay strong and close attention to what's happening in city council. They pay attention to what the mayor is doing. They pay attention to what the governor is doing. Right now, we're very involved in supporting people who want to have a change in the state income tax, where we can have a graduated income tax system rather than the flat rate income tax. So that's a big campaign, and it's going to be on the ballot in November. So we have a lot of neighbors involved in, in these issues. Um, we have neighbors involved in helping monitor and pay attention to the issue of police accountability. Mm -hmm. you, you name the issue, we've got we have people in our community that care about it and support our work on it. Uh, anybody wants to respond to uh, this, this, this topic uh, with regards to the um the enthusiasm when it comes to politics i mean and, and the more specifically the elections coming up this year uh what are people saying about it is, is there lack of is there, is there any apathy when it comes to especially the youth and if so i know eva you are uh, you know coming being you being a community activist are you playing any particular role if not uh what are some of the organizations do you can you identify that are trying to you know I'll galvanize the people and and then basically encourage them to participate in this space well i in in past years i have been very active this year i have kind of stepped back but i do know that there are quite a few people who are involved in the various different churches that are in the community that um are definitely taking a strong stance and trying to make sure that people are getting out there and getting getting the vote and get, getting out there to vote. Um, like I said, this year I've been kind of taking a stance back because I'm actually doing some work on my house right now. But um, other than that, um, I would be out there. And I, I'm closer to the election. I'm sure I will be out there. I was going to ask a question to um, Michael Glasser. Um, I was going to ask Michael Glasser um, since, uh, you know, we have to think about the ripple effects and the best practices in our community. And uh, one of them is that um, your involvement with Sullivan High School um, extended past uh, one thing you did for the school, and then it just like spiraled into other um events and other things that uh helped uh you know with the students with the thanksgiving you did um the the kiln you get the uh the library and name you after your mom and also the kitchen build can you can you share some of those things with us and the significance of that kitchen of the library with the audience mm -hmm. well thank you for asking that question um you know you you I'm giving you a lot of credit here, Andrew. I know it's a show that you've helped organize, but and but you're deservedly uh, entitled to this recognition. You are a consummate networker, and it's because of you that I was invited to a, a some kind of Christmas function on the South Side about nine years ago. And at that event, I met a, a teacher at Sullivan who works for uh, students who are um, considered low incidence. Uh, it, Sullivan had a, a big program for children with Down syndrome and, um, and who are autistic. And the gentleman was a teacher in a classroom and uh, he told me about the program. I said, well, what do you need? Uh, and he said, are you kidding me? What do I need? We want to convert, we want a life skills classroom for these children. You know, we're, we're stuck in a regular classroom with four walls and a desk, but these kids need activities and 
we need a room where they can learn how to cook and how to make a bed and how to do the wash and learn how to live independently. And when I heard him describe his need, I thought, well, my God, the Rogers Park Builders Group has nothing but uh, developers and landlords who do these kind of things. So I uh, invited some of my colleagues to this gentleman's classroom. Immediately, everybody jumped aboard this beautiful program where we raised the money and converted this classroom into a, a state-of-the-art life skills classroom, which really transformed these kids' lives. And it was a very moving, wonderful initiative. That level of involvement got me excited about the school, got me excited about the principal at the school. One person can make a huge difference. And Principal Thomas, then he was known as Principal Adams, um, inspired such change and welcomed a group like the Rogers Park Builders Group. Later, he, I, I was friends of Sullivan, so we could continue to offer support for the school, we, 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 we helped in a number of ways. We restored musical instruments for a band, but in Rogers Park unique way, it wasn't just a marching band we helped provide instruments for. This was a band that was one third the mainstream kids, one third uh, kids that were immigrants and refugees, and one third kids from this low incidence program joining together. It was incredibly uh, unique and special. So, you know, through all that work and time, I, I learned a lot about the refugee program, you know, and, and, and I'm sure the word diversity has already come up in this phone call, even when you're talking about, um, you know, the elections and, 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 and the, 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 the wealth of diversity in this community is really what's drawn me here. And the refugee, R Rogers Park has always been a community of refugees. Go back through the history. They might be from different uh, parts of the world, but the refugee uh, uh, presence in Rogers Park has always been strong. It's always been a welcoming community. I remember many years ago when I met some of the lost boys from Sudan, remarkable young people that with unbelievable stories. So Sullivan High School has been a, a, a place that's attracted refugees. Now it has uh, special funding for the north side of Chicago. And so one of our initiatives last year was to create a welcoming center for the refugees. Um, I was fortunate enough that some of the money raised uh, allowed us to name the, the, the center after my mother who passed away 30 years ago because she herself was a refugee. Um, and, and, and the alumni from the school from th uh, 30, 40 years ago, also refugees related to these kids and the remarkable, wonderful kids. And every year we have a Thanksgiving, refugee Thanksgiving, where the kids celebrate Thanksgiving for the first time. And so just a whole bunch of great stuff centered around Sullivan High School and um, in, in our other schools, our public schools uh, that, that, that feed into Sullivan are also very special places. So that was another long-winded answer, Andrea. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. And also, we're going to have to think about Juneteenth. When that happens next June, we're going to have to plan on that, too. Uh, let's see. I um, Is there, take it back to you, Senna. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea, for great, I mean, uh, great questions and uh, wonderful uh, discussion so far from our guest. Uh, number to ring in if you have a question or an opinion. It's our uh, comment to pass if you don't want to, if you know what, if you're not, you don't want to type it on Facebook. It's 815 227 5047. If you're watching on Facebook, please do us a favor by sharing so we can get the word of Roger Spark out there. We want to know, we want the world to know how awesome Roger Spark is, how awesome the people are, and the, the opportunities um, that are there. Uh, it, it, it's a great, great, great neighborhood. To move into to have family, raise family actually. So, uh, and also if you're looking for a career, uh, there are a ton of jobs there. Um, uh, so, so to help us by sharing the feed, you can also watch us on YouTube uh, as we speak at 29 minutes past 7 p.m. You're still watching and listening to the Progressive Mind Show live on Facebook, and we are talking to Eva McCain, Andrea Graham, Michael. Harrington, Michael Glazer, and we have Sandy Price, who's on the line with us. You can see her face earlier on in the show. 
uh, the older woman of 49 Ward, Maria Hayden, was here, and she gave us her uh, perspective on the pandemic so far, how it has affected her community, and how they've been handling it. And to you, my audience, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, we do have a call coming in. Uh, let's see if we can. Um, okay, so let's see if we can pick up this call. Uh, caller, can you tell us your name and where you're calling from? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Jay. I haven't been listening from the beginning, so forgive me if I ask a question that's probably being addressed already. Okay. Uh, but I, I do realize that you you guys are focused on a particular county, which is within um, an area that is currently very nationally controversial. Um, I, do you guys um, amongst yourselves have a solution or a suggestion as to how to bring down crime in these areas? Not necessarily within just the county, but you know, maybe statewide. Great question, uh, and this is from Jay. Um, Jay asked a very great question. Uh, does anybody want to pick up uh, on his question? He wants to know if what can be done with regards to uh, combating crime in Rogers Park, and not just what Rogers Park, but I think city, state, county, uh, city, city is where we have most crime issues. So anybody wants to uh, respond to that? I would like to address that. One of the things that um, I know I worked with um, community on is making a lot of positive activities, like making sure blocks have block clubs so neighbors get to know each other, having little um, coffee clutches outside or selling lemonade to, to community and um, make creating gatherings. Because if there are people outside doing positive things, guess what? The negative things are not going to be in that place doing it. So the people who want to do something positive go and invade the space where the people who are doing the negative things are taking place. Um, it used to be called positive loitering. Um, I don't know what it's being called these days, but we, you know, we used to go out and have picnics in the parks and have block clubs and do um, do community walks and, and things of that sort. And if the more um, the negative, uh, the people who are out there doing negative things see that there are people out there doing positive things, then they're going to leave the area because they don't want to be watched. They don't want to be seen. Um, and I know that that's one of the, the, the things that has worked in the Roger, not just in my area, but in Rogers Park in general, people going out doing positive things and, and making sure that, that things are, are happening, doing concerts in the park, having local bands, the high school bands, bring the high school bands out to come and perform. There are kids who have little garage bands and have them come out and do a performance on a corner or, or something and let the people, you know, the community gather and listen to them, give them some positive reinforcement as well. But the more positive things that are happening within a community, that means there's less negative things happening. Okay. No, great point. Great point. So we need to uh, invest more in positive things. I think Michael wants to respond. Michael. Yes, I, I would certainly underscore the importance of the social, community, cultural, the texture that, that we as people living in a community add to helping make sure that crime is not the number one issue on our plate. But we also need to pay attention to another tangent is that poverty produces crime and education is one important solution that we, that's why our organization Network 49 is keen about supporting public schools, giving schools all the resources they need to help children so that they can get jobs and so that they can be educated and become participating citizens in our culture rather than problems. So I'd say tackling poverty, joblessness, education support, are big issues related to crime, not just in any, our community, but anywhere in the world. That's unfortunately, these issues are neglected too much. Poverty continues and we need to have more work done to fight it. We need more work done to support education. We can support the military with billions and billions and billions, 
and we end up neglecting the fact that people need jobs, people need good schools to prepare them to be contributing to society rather than problems. Mm. Thank you.